Hi, so yeah, thanks for the introduction. I'm Ben. Um, I'm an architect developer at Theodore UK, which is a startup that helps other startups launch products quickly. And we also help large companies work more at a startup speed. Today, I want to talk about sharing code between React and React Native. So React Native sort of proposed this idea of a learn once, write anywhere paradigm, where we can have cross-functional teams that can develop our website and develop our mobile apps, which is really great. Um, some people are trying to take that further and share code between their mobile app and between their websites. And there are some barriers to that due to render environments, due to several build things. Um, but today, I want to talk about some technologies that are trying to tackle that and the methodology we used on the made.com project to try and achieve this. Made.com, for those of you who don't know, is a large e-commerce <clears throat> e uh, furniture store that helps cut down costs by having an innovative supply chain and logistics arm, but also has, doesn't have brick and mortar stores, so most of the transactions are happening online, which helps cut down costs for consumers. As the name suggests, Made.com's marketing is generally focused towards their website. They do have some showrooms in some European cities, and actually the airport here, they have a pop-up store. But it's generally their website and their mobile app that they're marketing to. If you live in London, you will have seen their marketing all over the tube and all over the train, trains and buses, and even across other European cities, they're spending a lot on marketing. I started the project with them at the start of last year, and at that time, that marketing was focusing people towards their existing website, which was a Magento, which is a PHP framework, templated website, and a mobile app that was iOS only and only in the UK. We started the project with them to move their website to React uh, iteratively and move their mobile app to React Native, allowing us to launch cross-platform across iOS and Android and also launch internationally. The other barrier to doing this was that they had developers who needed to be trained on React and React Native. So we wanted to make this move easy for them and ensure we could have code sharing between the React and React Native app, but also ensure it was easy for their developers to maintain after we left. When we started the project, we started to think about the different types of code that you have in an application. You have your UI render code, your render method of a React components. Your business logic, uh, how many items can users ask to add to their baskets, um, when can you use this voucher code. Configuration, which is quite a broad term. If you ever make a configuration folder in a project, a lot of stuff ends up in there. Um, but this is stuff like translations, constants, API endpoints, um, lots of other things. And API and formatting, so how we call APIs, be them RESTful APIs or GraphQL endpoints, and how we format the requests to send to the back end and the responses to come back. The big issue in sharing code when we come to the UI render, so I'm going to jump through these different types of code, is that in React Native and in React, we're in different render environments. Divs are not the same as views, and ULs are not the same as flat lists. We can't just copy paste the same components and use it in both render environments. There have been some technologies that have tried to solve this problem. So React Native Web is probably the most popular. So Twitter Lite is done in React Native Web, and Twitter were supporting React Native Web's open source project that pulled support last year just before we started this project. We played around with React Native Web for this project, but another requirement we had was server-side rendering. So for, this was mainly for performance and for search engine optimization outside of Google, so on Bing which is something that's fun to do. Um, the issue with server-side rendering is that React Native Web is, makes it more complex to work with Next.js, which is sort of the de facto server-side rendering solution. That, coupled with some other points I'm going to come on to in a moment, is why we didn't go down the React Native Web approach. React XP is a similar approach pushed by Microsoft, who are sort of between Xamarin and doing React XP. This had the same server-side rendering issues, and also we hadn't seen projects using this successfully. Finally, one thing I want to talk about quickly is an experimental branch of style components called Style Components Universal, or Style Components Primitives. This again has similar server-side rendering issues as React Native Web, and it's very experimental, but I want to jump into it for a moment to show the cool concept they tried to achieve. So style components, for those of you who have not used it, is a set of visual primitives for the component's age. So this is a set of, uh, it's a set of primitives, so like buttons, views, lists, it depends. So normally in style components, it varies between different render environments. So in web, you would use uh, button and uh, div. And in React Native, you'd still use button with an uppercase B, and you would use views. And here you can see we're importing 
uh, styled above, and then we'll use the button from styled and use the tag template literal notation to pass CSS directly in, and that'll be used in the components. And it's a really nice way to have CSS style syntax in line with your JSX and make your code more readable as you start to name all the components in your DOM. Style Components Universal was a branch of this which tried to tackle this problem of different render environments. It's, it then renamed to Style Components Primitives, having these primitives that can be shared across render environments. So here we've got it going to Web, going to Sketch, which is a really interesting way you can interact with designers, and going to React Native. It builds off um, a library called React Primitives, which is primitive React interfaces across targets, so across render environments. You can see it has quite an extensive list of supported uh, components. Though there are some notable exceptions, such as text input, because the variance between web and native makes inputs a more complicated thing to share. Showing a quick example of how you'd use React Native, uh, sorry, Style Components Universal. Here we're writing the code that will have an ampersand and a swatch name. So we're going to render a big tile, and inside of that, put the name of the swatch and a big icon of an ampersand. Um, I can't zoom in anything on here. Um, but if you can't see, we're just using swatch tile, which I've not shown up there, but then swatch name, which is a style.txt, and ampersand, which is a style.txt. Here we're not using an h1, we're using a text, which looks like a React Native component. The result of this is then we can render on React Native, which is how we'd release our mobile app. We can render on Sketch, which is how we might interact with designers. And we can render on web the same components shared across all those render environments. When we were looking into this at the start of the project, we were also thinking about maintainability and support across such a large application. Style Components Universal, or Style Components Primitive, came with the warning that this is an experimental release, there might be bugs, and there isn't a lot of documentation. So convincing the CTO of made.com to use this technology was not something that was going to go well. So in the end, we didn't go down this approach. And checking up with it more recently, um, there's a recent issue as of this year about what's the state of style components primitives. Well, React primitives has been superseded by React Native Web. So style components primitives would have to be uh, rebuilt to work off React Native Web and would have the same issues I discussed before on React Native Web. Regardless of all these technical barriers, and all those server-side rendering issues can be overcome, and there's good documentation on how to do it. I met up with some developers at the React Native London meetup. So my team from made.com and the developers at the React Native London meetup had a conversation about this problem, and should we even be trying to do what we were trying to do? The conclusion we came to is that web, mobile web, and native applications are in different environments and require a different design and a different user experience. Pressing a button on native is not the same as pressing a button on web, and therefore we shouldn't be trying to start share that part of our code. There are other parts of our code that are massively shareable and will allow you to go quicker and have less bugs, but the stylistic parts of the render method, not every part of the render method, as we all know some business logic can drip into those render methods, but the stylistic part of those render methods we don't think we should be trying to share. This ties in with the original release of React Native, which is saying that this is, a, this is not a write once, run anywhere paradigm. This is a learn once, write anywhere paradigm. We can have cross-functional teams across our mobile and our web applications, but these are different environments and have, should have different builds and different code. So going back to the breakdown of different types of code, as a team, we decided after several proof of concepts and a lot of debates that UI render code, specifically the stylistic parts of your render method, we shouldn't try and share across web and across native. But business logic configuration and API formatting are all candidates to be shared, and we're going to look at some examples of those. So API calls. So API calls, authentication, and the formatting of requests and responses, be that a RESTful API or an Apollo query, are all shareable. They're not render environment specific. If we make a post to a REST API on web, it's the same as making a post to the REST API on native, and this code should be shared. Configuration, which is again a really broad term. Let's say we have translations in our front end bundle, which is one approach to doing translations. We, if we change a translation for a typo on web, the same change should be made on native. And this configuration is therefore shareable and not render environment specific. Other configuration can include maybe your flow or TypeScript types, uh, URL endpoints, currency conversion. It's quite a broad term. And this is not to say that the same configuration has to work exactly the same on web and native. Configuration generally ends up being a JSON or a JavaScript object that we can share easily and extend using the spread operator. So we can share one object in some sort of shared library, which I'm going to come on to in a moment, and we can share that across web and native, but native can then override or extend that as we need. 
The final point, and quite a big point for applications, and normally a big point for testing, is our business logic. If a user can only add 20 items to their basket on web due to logistics or supply chain rules, the same is true for native, and we want to have that rule consistent across both, updated across both, and tested once in terms of unit testing across both, which means this is not render environments dependent. We can share this code fairly easily. To summarize the different types of code, we're saying that the stylistic parts of our render method in our UI render, we shouldn't be trying to share. But our business logic, our configuration, and our API formatting are all candidates for sharing. Giving a more specific example, we were using both Apollo and Redux on the made project, which feels a bit uh, of not a good approach. Um, the reason for this was, as part of the project, we worked with made.com to move their product catalog into an Elasticsearch database and have an Apollo client calling that. Their RESTful API still existed in their old Magento e-commerce system, and that RESTful API is used for things like placing orders and authentication. We needed Apollo just for retrieving data. We couldn't use it for mutating data, and we stuck with Redux for our data mutation and storing some application-specific logic around the basket and authentication. Also, the pattern of Redux sagas dealing with the RESTful API was really useful for us. But both these state management solutions are not render environment dependent. Our whole Redux store could be shareable across our React Native app and our website, and our Apollo queries are massively shareable across both those render environments. The important thing to mention is just because we can share everything doesn't mean we have to, so we can make it shareable, but because we were progressively migrating the website to React, but doing a whole rebuild of the native app, the native app invariably got further along the process and the website as we were going. That meant that certain parts of the Redux store weren't relevant to the website at that point, so we whitelisted which reducers we'd add in both the website and the native side. In terms of technology for how we can achieve this sharing, at the time, and yes, I should have replaced all these slides to use hooks, but at the time, we used higher order components. For those of you not familiar with the concept, it's not really part of the React API. It's just um, something that comes from the compositional nature of functional programming. We can have a component, which is just a pure function, that can take another component and wrap it. It could maybe add some props, mess with the map state to props, the dis map dispatch to props, and even interact with the lifecycle methods of that component. <clears throat> This pattern allowed us to do code sharing on the things I just talked about. So on the Apollo side, queries in Apollo are how we interact with the uh, API. A very standard pattern with Apollo would be to have a higher order component saying something like with data. It takes a query as its first argument and then returns a function. That function it returns is a higher order component. So it takes a wrapped component, the component to be wrapped, as a parameter, and then it will render that wrapped component inside of a query object, a query component that we import from React Apollo. It will inject the relevant props and pass through whatever props we also said that this component will need. We can extend that concept further, and in the project we had lots of higher order components with Apollo queries, such as with sofas, with products, with basket, with search results. All of these are massively shareable across render environments. And this was a big speed boost when we moved to different render environments, and a render environment we didn't anticipate at the start of the project, but we had towards the end of the project, which I'll talk about in a minute. A slightly more advanced version of the high order component pattern, which I guess some of you will have seen, is to make use of the recompose library. I'm giving this example because I want to show that we're not saying your whole render method isn't shareable. We're saying the stylistic parts of your render method, the layout of the divs and the style you apply to them, should be different across web and across native because we should have different user experiences. But some business logic can end up in your render method. Let's say we have a permission system that says you shouldn't be able to see this button if you don't have this permission, or you shouldn't be able to see this whole page if you don't have this permission. This could end up as an if statement in your render method, but if you use a higher order component pattern with recompose, recompose sort of being a utility belt for higher order component developments. You can define a, a render if authorized higher order components. This will only render the component you give it if you have the permission to do it, and otherwise will render an, un an unauthorized component, or you could render nothing in the case of a button because you shouldn't see it. So here we're importing React, of course. We're using Connect from React Redux, and we're using Compose, which allows us to chain several higher order components together. Branch, which allows us to do a ternary condition, an if condition, uh, whether we should render something or not. And Render Components, which does what it says in the tin and renders a component. We're using a selector, get user permission sets. This selector is, again, render environment independent. All of our selectors are shareable across our two environments. 
Um, so here we have a map state to props where we get the user's permission sets. Then we're making a uh, function that takes a permission and an unauthorized component. And that will again return a function, this function being your higher order component, which will compose the map state to props. And it will branch, taking the user's permissions. And if the user's permission set doesn't include the permission that we require, then we'll render the unauthorized component. Otherwise, we're going to render the argument to the higher order components. I'm showing this pattern because it shows that we can pull business logic up outside the render method and make it shareable across render environments. Moving away from those specific examples, I want to talk about the approach to sharing. I mentioned at the start of this talk that we were also training a team that weren't experienced in React and weren't so experienced in web development. Um, here, we took a multi-repo approach. I'm sure many people here would be more of a fan of a mono-repo approach. But the reason we did this here wasn't really a technical concern. It was more of a human concern. We wanted to build a mental model for these developers that some stuff should be shared and some stuff should not be shared. Making a pull request in a repository called shared really makes you think about how you can make that code highly shareable across render environments. Also, it means that we can have good quality control on pull requests, saying to people, OK, you're merging that into native. That's really a shareable high order component that if we rework in this way, we can share across render environments and save ourselves a week's work in a month's time. Having a look at that shared repository, what did it look like? Well, part of the, um, the directory structure was like this. So we had a high order components directory, which we were using as a pattern heavily at the time. Um, here we were having our Apollo queries, as I showed, uh, some conditional rendering, and many other examples of higher order components I'm sure you will have seen. In terms of configuration, stuff like translations, which were being done in the front end at that time, and uh, even your colors. So colors feel like a stylistic part, but your color palette can be the same even if your user experience is different. So if your colors are just a, an object that you might then import into a style components theme, we can share them across random environments. Types, so at the point we started this project, the battle between Flow and TypeScript wasn't as clear as it is now, so we went with Flow on this project. But regardless, Flow or TypeScript, those types are shareable across render environments. API, as we've seen before with Apollo, but also with the RESTful API, how we're making API queries can be shared as a higher order component. Finally, the whole Redux um, part of the code can be shared. Our actions, our reducers, our selectors, and our sagas, which are a library for doing uh, asynchronous actions in um, Redux, are completely shareable across render environments. In terms of building this shared library, at the start of the project, we didn't really want to transpile the code down. We were thinking we'd have to deal with source maps. We might lose our flow types. It was going to cause painful developments. Our conclusion, though, after trying this for several weeks, is that it was better to make a more traditional approach to this sort of node library we were building and transpile it down. The important thing to note is that we're transpiling down to CommonJS2. This resolves a lot of issues with React Native. And finally, this external parts of this Webpack configuration. This allows you to say, use the, let's say we have a parent uh, code base that's importing this library as a child. This says, use the importing parent's version of this library rather than the child's version, which is useful when maybe you're a minor version different on React. And it's useful also for simplifying some of the errors we were hitting. In terms of sharing the library, at the start of the project, we had quite a, an MVP approach to publishing this library. We were using a git tag approach and then doing a not best practice of building a bot user with read-only access to this one repository and then directly in the package JSON listing this as a requirement with the authentication token. This wasn't a great feedback loop for developers, and it wasn't a great way of having semantics to our versions. But one thing to mention is yarn link and npm link are extremely useful when you've got a shared library locally that you want to, um, when you have a library locally that you want to update and see results in another. After a while, we started hitting issues with that versioning system. The tags were not understandable to the developers. So we moved to Package Cloud, which is a private registry uh, for NPM packages. It's exactly the same as having a private NPM account. We just use Package Cloud because made.com were already using it for a different project. Here now we can see the package JSON has a much more standard looking dependency. We have a semantic version, and it looks much more traditional without that bad practice of our authentication token being in our package JSON. The point here being that you can have a much better workflow if you allow semantic versioning by publishing on a private registry. Earlier I mentioned that there was a render environment we weren't anticipating. This is where our generic approach to code sharing between React and React Native, not thinking about the render environment, but thinking about all the other code that we've been through, was really useful. 
I spoke with their head of labs towards the end of the project, and he was talking about the need for their showrooms, which you can see here. I think this is their showroom in London. Their showrooms having a need to sort of cross the bridge between digital and physical. They wanted to have an interactive experience for users where they could be in the showroom but interact with a 16-inch touchscreen, looking at sofas, uh, rotating them in 3D, um, going through Instagram and clicking sofas that they like and seeing SKUs that match them in the made.com uh, catalog, and even clicking styles they like and using machine learning to predict what style people have. Do you have a retro style or an industrial style? And suggesting products for those users to interact with. Now, a 16-inch touchscreen feels like quite a different render environment to a mobile app and quite a different render environment to web. In the end, the technical solution we made was to have um, an Electron uh, application that loaded a React bundle, and then we had that actually running on Windows boxes in the stores. Regardless of all that, the complete design for this was completely different to web and native. But we still benefited from code sharing. We could deliver that project in four weeks with only one full-time developer and one half-time developer, and only one pull request needed to be made on the shared library. Because all the business logic for getting stuff, all the business logic for restricting how many things you can add to your basket, these were all massively shareable and allowed us to move quicker because we'd made our code shareable and also render environment independent. The result of this is that we have these three applications with have, which have different user experiences. Although the branding looks the same, the experience of web and native is different. But we had code sharing across these, which allowed us to go faster and reduce the bugs we were having. We still have a bit of time left, so I want to talk briefly about um, our CI pipeline for the React Native app. We're using App Center to build our React Native app. So um, I'm sure some of you use App Center. Some people use it just for their crash reporting, some just for code push, and some for analytics. But App Center is built by Microsoft, and it um, can be really useful as a CI for your React Native project. The issue we had is that earlier move we had to move to a private NPM registry meant that we needed our CI server in App Center to be able to clone um, a private NPM repository, which seems like an easy thing if you use Circle or Travis. That's quite a trivial thing to solve. But App Center is pretty locked down in how you access their servers. They do, though, have really good support. So in App Center, there's a button at the bottom right. You can contact developers directly without going through a, a salesperson and actually get advice. So I sent them a quick message explaining the situation that we had a private NPM repo and that we wanted to know the best practice for being able to authenticate with that. For those of you who've not used NPM repos privately, the way you authenticate generally is an RNPM file, which you have in your directory. We didn't want to commit this to the code base, but we wanted it available uh, to our build server. Their reply was that this isn't currently possible. So they said, you can either use VSTS, Bitbucket, or GitHub. It's the first time I've heard them in that order. Um, and support for private repositories is not widely available yet, but you can have a look out uh, in the upcoming features. This made us quite annoyed because we, want, we just got semantic versioning. We didn't want to move back away from it. Luckily, we did find a way around it. I won't go through all the details now in the slides, but there's a blog article I wrote briefly on the subject. If any of you are hitting the same issues, just look it up. But basically, um, in App Center, you can have this post-clone script. It's a, it's a dot file that you can add to your repository, which allow you to do whatever you want in Bash after the GitHub repository has been cloned, but before the build starts, so before the yarn install or the NPM install. Here, we could write uh, some bash that allowed us to echo out an npm.rc file, and inside of that, put our token, which we had in an environment variable in the build, and this allowed us then to do authentication and keep our semantic versioning. So to conclude what we've gone over, code sharing is a great advantage of React and React Native. Also, the fact that you learn once and can write anywhere is the major advantage. You can have these cross-functional teams that can work both on your mobile app and your websites. This isn't to say that you should share all of your code, though. The render environments in native are different to the render environments in web. Pressing a button in native is different to web. Progressive web apps are starting to blur the lines a bit more. But at the minute, push notifications, access to file system, this is very different in web to how it is in native. Therefore, you should be trying to share your non-design render code, the non-design uh, or stylistic parts of your render method we should be sharing. The stylistic parts of your render method we should not be sharing. Your app and website have different user experiences. And at, at the point of this project, higher order components were a great pattern to share your logic. There are downsides to higher order components and challenges that come with them. And hooks are probably going to supersede many of the use cases I showed there. Publishing a private NPM package or publishing any shared package with semantic versioning will help your team have a better idea of what they're releasing. <clears throat> 
And finally, most of us here would probably go for a monorepo approach due to the advantages uh, that that has. Um, but a multi-repo approach can help your team build a mental model for code sharing. It can help people conceptualize what they're actually working on. Um, there were challenges that came with this. It was frustrating for developers to have to make two pull requests and get approval on two pull requests just to maybe change a color on the website. Um, but the fact that we had massively shareable code allowed us to move much faster later on and allowed us to go to a different render environment that wasn't predicted at the start of the project. So we managed code sharing between React Native, uh, between web, and between this kiosk environment that we sort of invented for ourselves. And we did this without sharing our stylistic parts, but allowing us to have the speed and testing shared across those environments. I think I'm finishing a few minutes early, but uh, I've been Ben from Theodo. If you have any questions, please grab me after the talk. The slides are online if you want access to them, and other articles and slides that I've written are all on my LinkedIn profile. Thank you. Thank you ben.